read out of 2 Kings <laughs> chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Hallelujah. This is the word of God, amen? amen. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, would God. Another way to say that would be, oh, I wish that God or I wish to God. My Lord, talking about her master Naaman, were with the prophet that is in Samaria. For he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed, and took with him ten talents of silver, and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter has come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that you may recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes. It means he tore his clothing. I've shared with the church on multiple occasions in the past that the Jewish people were very emotional in the way that they responded when they would mourn, when they were stressed emotionally. This is one of the ways that they would show their emotion. They would rip their clothes. They would cover their body in sackcloth, which is like a burlap sack that was very uncomfortable. They would take ashes and spread it all over their head and their face. And the whole reason behind that was so that they would have a, a a, a discomfort connected to the way that they were feeling and, and they would show great emotional distress and that's what this king is doing because he's fearful because he's receiving see right now in the time frame of Israel they're not really people of faith there are people that are living in failure. There are people that are living in the midst of sin. They're not really trusting God to minister on their behalf. And I have to tell you that whenever God's people fall into that trap, it clouds their vision. It makes it difficult for them to really trust that God's going to show up. Amen. And so the king of Israel right now is very distressed when he gets this letter because he's like, how am I going to heal this man of his leprosy? Oh my goodness, this king of Syria is much more powerful than we are and when I don't come through, something bad's going to happen to me. And so that's what's going on right here. And so he read his clothes and he said, am I God to kill and to make alive? And this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, or I beg of you, and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. He's trying to pick a fight with me. I'm so stressed out about this, is what he's saying. And it was so, when Elisha, the man of God, now he's the prophet. The king is the one that God has set up to be the leader of his nation, Israel. But we're in the, we're in the, the book of 2 Kings, and there's kings, and there's prophets, and the prophet is the voice of piece of God, the mouthpiece of God. And, you know, I, sometimes I get off on rabbit trails, but I just want you to know God has always had a witness in the land. Hallelujah. God has always had a mouthpiece Lord, in the land. Lord. God will always allow his word to go forth. He's faithful and he's true to his word. He said it will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish that which he set it forth to do. There is life Amen. In the word of God. Yeah. And somebody's got to speak it. Hallelujah. Yeah. And God's just looking for somebody that's willing to allow his word to get on the inside of them and to come out of them so that other people can hear the that's truth right. of the Amen. gospel. Amen. And so Elisha, the man of God, had heard the king of Israel had rent his clothes and that he sent to the king saying, Wherefore have you ripped your clothes? Let him come now to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall come again to thee, and you shall be clean. Now, I'm going to take another little detour real quick because I always like to bring these things up. Numbers have meaning in the Bible. This isn't really in my message. It really isn't in my notes. 
The number six is always connected to, to mankind, and that's why in the book of Revelation it talks about the number of the beast. His number is 666 because it's a fulfillment of humanity. If you look at what the Antichrist is going to do, he, he's just the same spirit of Satan. He exalts self above God. God created man on the sixth day, so the number six is connected to mankind. But the number seven, I said this Wednesday night, is connected to the rest of God. The fulfilled work of God. God. On the seventh day, God was completed with his work and he rested. God didn't have to take a nap. It's, it was to show mankind that the work was a completed work. Yeah. The Bible teaches. Now, you might get into conversations with people on the outside that have false doctrine and have bought into lies that get people caught up in all kind of a mess. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the Sabbath day. He is the ultimate fulfillment right. of rest. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, for I will give you rest. What was he talking about? He said, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This has nothing to do with my message, but I want to share something with you because maybe you're going through some things. Maybe you're going through some things and you feel a burden in your life. A yoke was an instrument that was made out of two pieces of wood. And what it did was it connected two beasts of burden together. In other words, if you needed to plow a field, you put two oxen together and you'd yoke them. So now you're getting the power of two animals and you could plow through the field. Jesus is saying that I am the one that can accomplish accomplish the right. work Amen. in your life. Hallelujah. If you will yoke yourself and connect yourself to me, I will remove the burden in the midst of your life. I will carry it for you. I will give you the strength that you need in order to get through and to go through what it is that you're facing. Amen. Jesus, hallelujah. That's the word of God. He will always repeat the same thing. It's going to be in his power. In your weakness, my strength is made perfect. But the question is, when will we allow him to have his way in our our lives, right. when will we find ourselves submitted to the plan of God? The prophet said to Naaman, go to the Jordan and dip yourself seven times. Go to the fulfilled and the finished work of God, which ultimately in the New Testament was Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. That he died on the cross. And when he said with his last breath, it is finished because the work was complete. And you need to know that this morning. Yes, you yes. need to know that whatever it is that you're going through, whatever it is that you're facing, God has already made the way. Jesus has already accomplished the work. The, what we need to do is we need to submit. But just like Naaman that we're about to get to in this story, many times we don't want to do it God's way. Let me not get ahead of myself. He says, go into the Jordan and you need to go ahead and you need to dip yourself seven times and your flesh will come again to thee and you will be clean. But Naaman was wroth. That's another word for angry. He was just full of fury. Mm -hmm. He went away and said, Behold, I thought I, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. He just wants him to wave his hand around and say, Be, be healed in the name of Jesus. And he says, are not the are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather then when he says to you to wash and to be clean... Then went he down, and he dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord God, and we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd give us revelation. We pray that you'd go before us and that you'd speak truth to our hearts and our lives, Lord God, because the preacher can, can, can try his best to open up the scriptures, Lord God, but we need your revelation, Holy yes. Spirit. We need your help. You are the true preacher. You are the true teacher, and we pray that you would do what you do, Lord God, in Jesus' name. You know, uh, hallelujah. I, you know, I was just kind of writing down just to give you like a little bit of an introductory kind of thought process. I was thinking to myself about how for so long as a Christian, I would read the Bible kind of like in a piecemeal approach. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'd, okay, I feel led to read Romans right now, and I'd always try to read at least one proverb a day. And, and I would kind of go through and I'd read, you know, maybe something in the Old Testament if the Lord put it on my heart. But I never really read the Bible from the beginning to the end. I'm not trying to 
pick on anybody if you've never read the Bible from the beginning to the end. I'm just trying to make a point that once I did read the Bible from the beginning to the end, it really changed my understanding of the scriptures. It, uh, you know, before I understood concepts of some concepts about God, but once I began to read it from the beginning to the end, I began to understand God's plan in a much bigger picture. I, I began to receive more of an organized thought about what God was doing, I guess, and saw connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, it became more organized, like I said, in my mind. I began to see also repeated themes throughout the Word of God. I've shared some of this with y'all before, but I would see repeated themes throughout all the pages of Scripture. Things like God's mercy and grace. Things like trials, that God would allow trials in people's lives repeatedly, over and again. In all of these different characters in the Bible, you would see that God would allow trials to come into their life for the purpose to turn their hearts towards Him. Amen? Uh, I would see also even that mankind, in many of these stories, repeatedly, mankind is selfish. You can see uh, in the Old Testament how the, the, the people of Israel, even though God continued to provide for them time and again, moving miraculously in the midst of their lives, whether it was manna from heaven, parting the Red Sea, so many different ways to remove, you know, removing them out of Egyptian bondage. In so many ways, he would constantly show up for them, yet at the same time, they would constantly rebel against him. And if we were honest with one another, and I know that I've shared this many a times, but I continue to do it as we get new, you know, some new people into the church, that one of the ways that God has revealed his word to me, I just remember one time I was sitting down and God spoke to my heart and he said, you know, it's like I had two sons. One's name was Israel. He was big brother. And the other one's name was Christian. He was little brother. And Paul said that they were to be examples unto us. Where, you know, you can many times if you watch your big brother or someone that was ahead of you go through life and you can see the mistakes that they made. I mean, let me just tell you, my daddy used to tell me, you know, boy, when I when I was grow, when I was coming up, I went through the school of hard knocks. That's the university I graduated from long before I ever graduated from SLI as a bulldog. He said, but, you know, you're kind of like your old man. You're hard headed and you don't want to learn anything from the things that I've tried to teach you. But you go on about your way and you're going to learn, too, from the school of hard knocks. I guess that's kind of like what I'm trying to say is that, you know, Israel went through the school of hard knocks and here we are are in the New Testament as believers with the Spirit of God and the Word of God and we're able to look backwards at what they did in their life and we're able to make a connection and when many times we will see the decisions that they made, the failures that they made, and then also their repentance and their getting back up and we say, man, or at least for me when I finally read it from cover to cover, I was like, that's me. Like I'm the book of Judges where God keeps on every time I make a decision to go back and connect myself to the world and then I find myself in bondage again. But then the next thing you know, God will raise up a judge and bring deliverance. Hallelujah. We're all excited and we're thanking God. Oh, thank you, Lord, for showing up in the midst of my life. The next thing you know, here I am again. Oh, the children of Israel sinned against God and they reconnected themselves with the gods of the world. They find themselves in bondage again, but God's faithful like he is. He's merciful and faithful and gracious and true. He'd rise up another judge and bring deliverance to the children of Israel. Has anybody ever lived there before? I know that I have. You don't have to raise your hand because I raised my hand for you. And so that's the point that I'm trying to make whenever I see in the scriptures and I see these repeated themes. And one of these things is mankind being selfish, but yet God, even in the midst of all of that, being gracious and merciful, amen, sacrificial in his love. That's the difference between God's love and man's love. Man's love is so selfish. Even whenever he's trying to do his best to love somebody, he's got his own motives. He's got his own plans in his heart. He wants to get a little something, something out the deal. God, on the other hand, gave everything. Hallelujah. He bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession. Jesus never once failed the Father. Amen. Yet he put him on a cross. He allowed him to die. Humbled him. Naked in the noonday sun as the, as the people that walked by. Scott 
disgusted him. The religious leaders, oh, look at him up there on the cross. He said he was going to rebuild the temple in three days. He can't even save himself. How is he going to save anybody else? And then the world, the Bible says, they wagged their heads. They scoffed and they laughed. Can I tell you a little secret? If you're really going to serve the Lord and you're going to be willing to live for God the way that God called you to live for him, you will be scoffed at by the world. Your old friends that you used to hang with and you used to run with, they're not going to like the new life that God's given you. They're not going to accept the new life. The world will never like to have communion with a true child of God. There are two spirits that are contrary one to the other. This isn't even in my message, but somebody needs to hear it this morning. Right. The two spirits are contrary one to the other. There's a spirit of disobedience, according to Ephesians chapter 2, that works in the children of disobedience, the prince of the power of the air, he's causing the whole world to go in one direction. And Paul said this. He said, and you used to be one of them. You used to be just like them. Till you gave your heart to the Lord. Till you heard the gospel and you bowed your knee. And you allowed God to change you. And then when you did, hallelujah, you were born again from the dead. New spirit came to live on the inside of you. And the new spirit was contrary to the spirit of the world. And didn't want to have anything to do with that. Listen to me. When you begin to live your life for the Lord, the old people that you used to run with yeah. and you used to hang with. They, you know, one of the best things I should, I, this was a learning experience for me. I can remember when I first got saved. I was living with my sister. I mean, I got out of Lafayette, dude. It was a mess. That's a whole other story. But I remember one time one of my friends called me up. Hey, man, we're coming through Morgan City. We're going to home and we're coming to pick you up. And we're going to spend the night over there. And we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. You know, when I hung up the phone, and, and you know, we ain't taking no for an end. When I hung up the phone, I already was stirred, yeah. like it wasn't right. I've done this a couple of times in my life, or like a little, like a little whoop dog, you know, with my tail between my legs. I kind of walked over there, and I got into the car. We weren't even very far down the road, and man, I'm telling you, already I'm feeling the conviction of the Lord. But you know what ended up happening was we ended up in a bar room, and I've got a couple beers in me. Next thing you know, I'm not really as convicted as I used to be. I'm kind of loosening up. Boy, the old man's coming back to life. <laughs> yeah, and I don't really feel as bad as what I did, you know, and I don't remember what all we did that night, but I can just remember the next day. Just, you know, trying to do it all over again. You know, the proverb talks about that, you know, getting drunk till the midnight hours. And then, then he says, I feel like I'm on the on a mast, like on the sea and I'm rocking back and forth. Can't wait till I get up so I can do it all over again. And that was me. That was them. That was my life before. And I was sitting there in that in that living room. And all of a sudden I said, man, y'all got to take me home. Mm. What, what you talking about, dude? We ain't done yet. No, no, y'all got to take me home because mm. you know what? I, I ain't the same as I used to be. And I don't want to live this way. And we got in, hallelujah. We got, I can remember when we got in that car and they started talking. And this is what one of them said. My, he used to be my best friend. He said, man, y'all remember? They used to call me Fat. Fat Matt. Fat friend. Fat Matt the River Rat. All right. Yeah, man, you, remember, you remember that fat? Man, that dude was so cool, man. You remember when we used to party with him? How fun he was to party with? Like, I wasn't in the car. Like, talking. And, you know, I was just like, whatever y'all think, man. You know, and, and I don't really know why I went there, but I did. And I just know that God changes people. Yes. Amen. And I think that the main idea that I was trying to get across is, is that whenever you truly desire and decide to live your life for the yeah. Lord, amen, that the world is not going to accept you. But I'm going back to my message that without a doubt, as I began to read the word of God from cover to cover and I began to see a theme that occurred throughout the word of God, that I could see that there was a plan of salvation, amen, that there was a clear plan, that the Bible had perfect unity between the Testaments, you know. I can remember taking a class one time that said that the Bible wasn't, you know, that liberal scholars instead of conservative ones that believe in the Word of God would say that the Word of God wasn't in unity, but that it was it was not unified. And I mean, once you begin to read it with the Holy Spirit opening your eyes, you're like, no, man, this is such a beautiful plan. And you begin to see it on every page that you turn. And that's ultimately what happened, that... Even in the lives of these Old Testament characters, I would begin to see the plan of salvation repeated. Amen. The plan of redemption. What does redemption mean? It's just a it's a it's a biblical term that describes the fact of being bought back. 
You know, we were sold into slavery in our first birth with Adam as sinners, but God sent his son Jesus to pay a ransom price, like the song sang, amen, to purchase us back unto God. Not to pay a ransom to the liar. No, God was the offended party. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay a ransom so that he could remove the guilt that stood between you and I and prevented us from getting to God. But in these Old Testament characters, like here's an example. Old Testament Israel. I, I know I've used this as an example before, <clears throat> but as a whole, the whole nation of Israel in, on the Passover. If you've ever read the story of the Passover, you know, I know some of you have and some of you maybe haven't. So let me just tell you real quick. There was a there was a celebration before when the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt and God told Moses to tell the children of Israel in each family to take a lamb and to cut its throat and to collect its blood and to take that blood and to paint it on the doorpost and the side post of their house and on the outside and then to go on the inside of the house and to eat the lamb. This is a type of, of Jesus dying on the cross and us partaking of that spiritually speaking as spiritual food. The Bible says that God said, I'm going to have judgment pass through the land. And if you're not in the house eating the lamb and you don't have blood painted on your doorpost, then you're going to die. The plague of death is going to destroy you. I have to tell you that for you, us in the New Testament, what this means is you've ever you've either received Jesus or you haven't. Then you, you've either taken the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and painted it on the doorpost of your heart, or you haven't. You've either partaken of the Lamb, Jesus said in the New Covenant, I am the New Covenant. My, my body is bread indeed, my blood is drink indeed, and you've either partaken of Him spiritually, or you haven't. If you have, then the blood is painted on the doorpost of your heart, and, and see, judgment in the end will pass over you. I wanted to see, to, to explain to you what I'm trying to say is, is that a repeated thing. The nation of Israel and Passover was a type of Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross. Does that make sense? But even, it gets even better than that. Another example is Abraham, the one that God called out and made a nation through him, right? And we know about the promised son that he had, right? The Bible teaches that Abraham was 99 and Sarah was 90. And the point to that is, is that there was no hope in his physical body being able to accomplish the will of God. But yet God supernaturally allowed Sarai to have a supernatural child named Isaac. Just as Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin, amen, in a supernatural way in order to bring salvation to mankind. But it gets even better than that because the Bible teaches that Abraham took Isaac one day because God said, you're going to bring him up on a mountain that I'm going to show you and you there, you're going to sacrifice him. I got to tell you that the Bible teaches that Abraham laid wood on the lad's back and he carried it up that hill as a sacrifice to be offered up unto God. But at the last moment, God put a ram in the thicket and Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh, God the provider. I'm here to tell you that thousand, two thousand years later, God would provide a ram in the thicket. His name was Jesus. He was a father that sent his son. The son carried wood up a hill called Calvary and died on a cross to pay the penalty of sin. But it gets even better than that because later on, he's looking for a bride. Abraham said, you got to go get a bride for my son. Let me tell you something. The gospel teaches that Jesus is looking for a bride. Jesus is looking for somebody. The father's looking for somebody to marry the son. And he sent his servant, Eliezer, a type of the Holy Spirit. He said, go get my son a bride from amongst my people. And the, and the Holy Spirit, Eliezer, went on that journey and he brought Rebecca back to Isaac and I'm here to tell you that that's what the gospel message teaches that God has a plan a plan of salvation he sent his son who is the bridegroom is another word for the groom and he's looking for a bride that'll connect himself and marry himself and he's coming back for a bride that's without spot or blemish hallelujah and the only way you'll be without spot or blemish is if you be found in Christ if you be covered with his blood Hallelujah, because you and I both know if it's up to us and what we're trying to accomplish, we're going to fail it. We're going to mess it all up. But if you hold on to the Lord, hallelujah, he'll see you through to the end. Praise you, Jesus. That's what I found out when I read it from Co 
cover to cover. Yeah. Themes, repeated patterns in the scripture. And some of these common elements that I found repeated is that essentially God's salvation plan teaches that all man is born into sin and in need of cleansing. I need you to know that. Look, look at Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Don't walk out of this church today thinking you all holy and you better than everybody else. Because the Lord knows we were all born into the same boat. Yeah. 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 Speaking of boats, if you weren't here this morning when I said it, y'all need to go look in the room next door whenever before y'all leave and see, the, see the, how they fixed up the kids' room. But I want you to see in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, the Apostle Paul says this. This is what is written. There is none righteous, no, not one. Did you think that because you never committed adultery or you never killed anyone, because you never stole, that you were okay? Right, right. Did you think that, oh, yeah, well, I never, I mean, I might have told a little lie when I was a little kid. Did you think that that was going to get you in? No, the Bible teaches there's none that are righteous. No, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not one. Man left to himself right. will not do goodness towards God. Amen. God moving by his spirit upon man will draw man's heart towards him. Now let's look at Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 through 6. This is another example of an Old Testament scripture that describes the plan of God, the salvation plan of God. <clears throat> this is 700 years <clears throat> before <clears throat> Jesus was ever born. I want you to see this. Look how it starts. Who has believed our report? In other words, who believed the story that we were telling? Who's we? The prophets, the Old Testament prophets that told the story about God's plan. Look at this. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? You know what the word arm means in the Old Testament? It's kind of like head or hand. In this case, it's talking about power. The, the right hand of God, the arm of God, the strength of God. Who will God reveal his power to? And then he goes and he, he says this, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. He's talking about Jesus right here. 700 years before Jesus was ever born, the prophet was prophesying that Jesus would come. He would grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. You know what that means? He doesn't look pretty. Look, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The world don't want Jesus. Now don't be fooled by this big old production that what we're calling the modern church where everybody's flocking to that. The real Jesus, the world doesn't want any part of. He's not glamorous enough. He doesn't, he doesn't glitter like gold. And I'm here to tell you that the world doesn't want the real Jesus. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. That's talking about the cross. He has borne our griefs um, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him or we saw him as stricken. We saw him as though he were smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace or the correction for our peace was upon him. And with the stripes we are healed. Look at this. This is where I really want you to see. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was one of the first things I wanted to, to, to explain to you. An element that's repeated in the Bible is that mankind needs cleansing. Yeah. This is a repeated theme that's within the Word of God. The, the second uh, repeated theme that I want you to see in the Word of God says that God's plan requires that people be made aware that they need to be cleansed. In other words, okay, so you're unclean. Well, golly, preacher, you make me feel real good this morning. But you need to know that there's a plan of cleansing. Amen? And that's where we come into the fact that God always has a mouthpiece to tell people the good news. Look at Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. This is the good news right here. <laughs> Unclean, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 
How's somebody going to call on the name of the Lord or believe in Jesus if they've never heard the true gospel? Listen, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, and I got to be careful because I get very conversational in my messages. But how many would agree with me that there was a long time in your life that you sat in the midst of religion, but you did not necessarily really, really, really know the good news that the fact that Jesus died for your sin, amen, to set you free? I see hands going up all over the congregation. I know that that was my life. For so long of my life, I didn't really know the true gospel until my sister got saved. Hallelujah. And she started being a mouthpiece for God. Yeah. She said, Matt, Jesus died for sinners. Amen. He says, how shall they call on him who they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of who they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed. I just put this verse in there because it connects back to where we just were in Isaiah. When I read it, I was like, oh, wow, that's the same. So I added this verse, okay, you hear? But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? See, not only does the gospel have to go forward, but people also have to respond by faith. Amen. Yes. And when you truly respond by faith, there's a life change that does take place. Amen. Number three, it requires submission to the plan of God. That goes back to what I was just saying. You got to respond. Look at Romans chapter 12, verses one through two. Just bear with me. We're getting ready to get somewhere. Romans chapter 12, verses one through two. The apostle Paul says this. I beseech you or I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you would present your bodies like a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I already mentioned once that the spirit of the world that is, behind, that is ch trying to change the mindset of human beings on the earth, right? And, and, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to conform. That's what the word of God said. It said, don't be conformed to this world. It means to be molded from an outside source. You have to, the Bible says right here, you have to present yourself as a sacrifice to God. You have to present yourself as one that has died and has been resurrected. And now you're giving your life back to God. It just makes sense. God gave his son Jesus and Jesus gave his life for you. Now God's asking for you to give your life back to him. And what the word of God says, it's a reasonable service. He's not really asking anything extravagant from humanity. It's reasonable. When you consider all that the father has done, right? I mean, if we really believe the story. It's not really extravagant. He's just saying, hey, listen, it's your reasonable service. But don't be conformed to the world because the world's going to tell you something different. The world's got a different message. The world's going to say, oh, no, exalt self. Oh, no, don't lower self. Oh, no, don't let self die. No, no, let self live. That's the lie of Satan. That's the lie of the world that's telling mankind to keep on living instead of letting self Die. I'm not talking about physically. I'm not talking about us really dying physically. I'm talking about us allowing God to have his way right. in our life. Amen. Amen. And to not be conformed to the ways of the world, but instead to be transformed, to take upon ourselves the thinking of God, the thinking of God's word. Amen. That will transform your mind and your heart. The world and the spirit behind it have a mindset all their own. The mindset of God is that you have to present yourself to him. Now, lastly... The last theme I want to tell you about for this today's message that I see repeatedly throughout the scripture is that God's plan explains that if someone will believe the report of the Lord and submit to him by faith, guess what? They can receive new life. Amen. You don't have to turn all these scriptures, but John 3, 3, Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom right. of heaven. You can turn to Galatians 2, 20 on the screen, though. And I will tell you, there's another scripture in Romans 6 because we're moving fast. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. I want you to read Galatians 2, 20 right here. Paul says this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. 
Yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, talking about my physical body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. A glorious gospel message that teaches that not only do we die with him, hallelujah, but according to the Romans 6 passage, we also resurrect to a new life in him. The word of God says this, look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. And then we're about to transition into the message. Amen. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5.17 says this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Yes. Hallelujah. Behold, all things have become new. So there's not only a death in Christ where the old man born of Adam becomes one with Jesus in his death and his burial. But there's a resurrection in Christ where a new life is given because a new spirit, hallelujah, lives on the inside of man. And the story that we read this morning is an example of all these elements. An example in the Old Testament of how God repeatedly tells his thoughts and repeatedly reveals his plan of salvation, even in the stories about the lives of the Old Testament characters. In the story that we just read, we have these concepts played out and illustrated through the, that show us the aspects of salvation. Y'all ready? Got four points. I guarantee you we won't be here past, we'll be here another 15 minutes. Y'all can hang with me 15 minutes? <laughs> I'm not a, a short-winded preacher. Now, point number one. You ready? A man with a need for cleansing. Praise God. It said in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, that Naaman was the captain. It's another word for general. He was the leader of the king of Syria's army. The Bible also said that, that he was honorable because the Lord had given him victory. And not only that, he was also a mighty man in valor. But... Naaman had a problem, but the Bible says he was a leper. You know, that word valor describes the fact that he was a man of increased stature. He was a man of power in the community because he was a mighty man. Not only that, he was a man of great wealth. He had everything that the world could have offered, but he had a problem. Mankind born of Adam is born in sin. And Naaman was a leper. And let me tell you something. Le the, the curse of leprosy in the Old Testament was a type of uncleanness that symbolized sin. The Bible also uses yeast or leaven to describe and symbolize sin. Time and again, when we see leprosy, it's a type, it's a symbology of sin. And you know, you know what, what leprosy would do was it would eat away the flesh. We know now in medicine that it was actually, it's called Hansen's disease also. It was actually a bacteria. It was a bacteria and it can be cured now. But back then they didn't have a cure for it because it requires strong antibiotics. And it would, literally it would eat away at the flesh. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen movies before uh, where they had a leper in there, there's a lot of movies that have a leper, uh, they would cover their disfigured bodies. Right? And what would happen is, is that because they were unclean, the Bible talks, I'm, I don't have time to get into it, but in the book of Leviticus, if you were in the proximity or you touched the clothing or you touched someone that had leprosy, you were considered unclean. And ultimately, that would make you unclean to the point where you couldn't go to the temple of God. So the leper certainly couldn't go to the temple of God. And what would happen is we're talking about point. This is point number one. Showed up just in time. Point number one says that there's a man that needed cleansing. We're talking about the plan of salvation. Hallelujah. And so what would happen is, is that these lepers would cover their disfigured bodies because, you know, I mean, it's pretty gross. You know, they didn't want everybody to see. They were embarrassed of their disfigured body. And they would walk through the streets, and I've shared this before, but they would, they would have to scream, unclean, unclean. Now, I don't know about you, but that would that's very embarrassing to have to walk around and, and, and to have your body disfigured and to have to scream unclean. But they had to warn the people. And it, if you could only imagine the fact that it would isolate them, it would isolate them from society, but it would also isolate them from the presence of God because they couldn't go to the temple of God. Right. And i got to tell you that sin will still do the same thing. That's right. Amen. That's right. Sin will still isolate you from the presence of God. There might not be a law in the New Testament that says thou shalt not go to the church because you sinned last night. But what will happen is, is that the sin in your life right. will make you feel uncomfortable. And sometimes we get confused wow. between the conviction of the Lord and the condemnation of Satan. Yeah. And the sin in our lives will make us desire not to be in the presence of the Lord. Because just as in the garden when Adam sinned, the Bible says that they hid themselves amongst the trees. Mm -hmm. 
Sin will separate you from the presence of the Lord. Yeah. Just as it did in Naaman's life, it separated, and, and all of the lepers in the Old Testament, it separated them from the presence of the Lord. But not only that, let me tell you something. Sin will also disfigure you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sin will steal from you. Amen. You know, it's a sad thing whenever you look at a picture of someone and whenever they were youthful before sin had its way in their life and they're so fresh looking, you know what I'm saying? So beautiful, so almost a look of innocence yeah. upon them. And then whenever they, they yield to sin and refuse to let go, you begin to see through time the changes that take place, the, 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 the physical appearance, what it begins to do, how it begins to disfigure, and it'll begin to eat away at them. Let, let me tell you something, sin ain't nothing to be played with. It's a slow and insidious thing. I, just, I would, just like the little girl said, I would that my master would be able to see the prophet uh, of Israel so that he would be cured of his leprosy. You know what I would? I wish sometimes that we all, I'm talking about to, to, to the preacher too, would see the effects of sin immediately. Oh, if we could just see the effects of sin immediately. Lord, show us a picture of what it looks like tomorrow. If we don't bow our knee and allow you to have your way in our lives, but no, that ain't the way it works. It just slowly picks yes. it away, slowly yes. steals, yes. slowly disfigures and changes the way that we look, Lord, help us. Yes, Lord. That was point number one. There was a man that needs cleansing, but I got good news too. I put that in there because I didn't want to leave you with that. God is a God of restoration. Because I have seen time and again where sin will begin to steal and begin to cause people's appearance to begin to look a particular way. But hallelujah to the Lamb of God when they would bow their knee, all of a sudden that glow returns. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That softness returns. God will begin to do a work in the midst of their lives. That was point number one. There was a man that needed cleansing. Point number two. A little girl with a message of hope. Amen. In 2 Kings 5, 2 and 3, the Bible said that the Syrians had grabbed a hold of this little girl. I don't really know. It doesn't tell us exactly what happened. I'm imagining that there was a skirmish. That took place and all of a sudden there's this little girl that's left on the battlefield and naming the leper. He snatches her up or tells him, hey, bring that little girl to my house. And she's now a servant. You know, I started seeing so many different things with this little girl. I mean, she's in bondage. You know, according to the rights of the world, I mean, the, the way of the world's thinking, she has every right to be bitter. She was just going about life, probably playing in her front yard. And all of a sudden, the Syrian army comes through town. And next thing you know, she's scooped up and she's brought away from her family. Brought away from her family and she's over here forced to serve in the midst of this man Naaman's house. How bitter would that cause many of us? You know, so many times we're in this life and we get dealt a hand that we just don't like. Right, right, right. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Amen. So many things that the devil will whisper in our ears that we don't like about this. We don't like about that. <laughs> and, and we find excuses yeah. to become angry. And we'll blame God for it. I mean, even if we don't come out and say it, we blame, you know, okay, well, fine, then. I'm just, if I'm not happy, then, you know, I'm just going to do whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's not what this little girl did. This little girl, I can see her full. I mean, I'm, you know what I see her as? I see her as a New Testament believer filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, tarry for me in Jerusalem and you will be endued with power from on high and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in, in, in Judea, and in Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. God, hallelujah, according to his plan, wants to baptize each and every believer with the Holy Spirit, with the power of God so that they can be messengers of the, of the message of God. And here's this little girl. I just see her skipping, doing her little housework. And she said, oh, would, oh, I wish that my master Naaman could see the prophet that's in Israel. Because he would cure him of his leprosy. She's just walking around and she's just preaching the gospel. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's, that's, that was the second part of it. You know, she could have been bitter, but just like Joseph in the Egyptian prison. That's right. Hallelujah. See, you and I, we might be prisoners to some extent on this earth. Because can I tell you something? This earth, did you know that this world is not your home? 
Oh, you can plant a tree in your yard and act like you're going to stay for a while. You're going to hang some paintings on the wall if that's what you want to do to make yourself home, for, you know, make yourself feel homey and settled. But if you're a true believer, Peter said this. He said, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul. Then Peter said this. He said, you're a stranger and a pilgrim in this land. If you're born again, born again from the dead and born again unto God, this place is not your home. And, and, and you know, that's what I see in this little girl, too. She, she realizes I might be over here in Syria. Right, but I'm a citizen of Israel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm a citizen of Israel. She was a child of God. We're the children of God. And sometimes we might find ourselves facing situations that we don't like, but we still have a message of hope for people that are riddled with leprosy and that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That was point number two. A little girl with a message. Point number three. We're getting close. He almost missed his healing. I want you to know that. He almost missed his healing because one of the points that I made to you is that, guess what? You got to submit to the will of God. Amen. You got to do it God's way. That's what it said in 2 Kings 5, 10 through 12. The Lord told him, we don't have to go back and read it again. I mean, you can read it if you want. But the Lord told him, go to the Jordan and dip seven times. The Lord spoke through Elisha and told him what he wanted to do. Remember what happened? He got mad. He got full of rage. The Bible said he was wroth with the anger of God. Not, not the anger of God. I'm sorry. The anger of man. He was wroth. I don't want to do it that way. That just doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. The Jordan River is dirty. And people know that. That the Jordan River is dirty. And, you know, I don't know for sure. But I guess that Farpar and the other and Abonner uh, over there in Syria were probably crystal clear and beautiful. You know, just nice, this nice little flow through the meadows in Damascus. Surely those rivers are better. Surely I could go and dip in there. No, you can't do it your way. If you refuse to submit to the way and the will of God, how many times is it in our life? But I don't want to do it that way. I don't want to do it that way. And that's the world's, that's the conformed way of thinking of the world. God's ideas seem to be ridiculous. How in the world? I used to like when Brother Larson used to say this. How illogical is it that 2,000 years ago, a 33 and a half year old Jew hung naked on two pieces of wood outside a city called Jerusalem, and that if you would believe in that, you would have eternal life? Brody. How illogical and ridiculous does that sound to the human mind, to the right. natural mind? Yeah. Yet for 2,000 years, people that have been willing to believe that message have seen, hallelujah, their lives yes, transformed. Yes. Praise oh, God. God. The plans of the prophet made no logical sense. And besides that, he really didn't want to do it God's way. That's two things that I see. Number one, sometimes the gospel doesn't make a lot of sense. Sometimes God's will for our lives doesn't always make a lot of sense. God will open up doors and tell us to go in a certain direction. But not only that, sometimes we just don't want to do it God's way. Come on, somebody. Help me out. I'm preaching better than your amen. <laughs> you know, sometimes we just don't want to do it God's way. No, I'm going to stiffen my neck and harden my heart. And I don't want to do it the way you want me to do it, God. Amen. I mean, sometimes this stuff's easy. It's so blatantly obvious that we're not supposed to be doing stuff. But sometimes there's little bitty things in our lives. Little things that God's dealing with. About. No, don't want to lay it down. Don't want to do it. I got to tell you, though, this is that as ridiculous as sometimes it might seem, I'm here to tell you what the Word of God says. 1 Corinthians 1. 18 and 19 says this for the preaching of the cross that word in the Greek is logos it means the message the word the message the the the, the story the report like Isaiah said who has believed our report the report or the message of the cross is to them that perish foolishness in other words, if you're perishing and you're dying and you're in the midst of your sin, then the word of the cross is foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. There is power in the message of the cross. It might sound foolish, but I'm here to tell you that there is power. 
power in the word of the message of the cross. Hallelujah. It's not because of two pieces of wood that you stare at. You think that by staring at these two pieces of wood or you even think about the physical torture that Jesus went through. No, it's what was accomplished in the spiritual realm when Jesus died on the cross. Because of the sinful nature that we inherited from our father Adam, there's a power to behind sin that will drive mankind to head in a certain direction and it's stronger than your willpower. Oh, you can try to want to do what God wants you to do but the reality of it is is that when the sinful nature has a hold of your backside I don't know how else to say it when it's flared up and flamed up in the midst of your life you cannot control it it is more powerful than your will I don't care what any law preacher tries to preach to you I'm here to tell you that there's only one way to get victory over the power of sin hallelujah and it's through what Jesus did it sounds foolish to the heart of man Sometimes, well, the reason that it doesn't work, I want to remind you, is that we have a submission problem. There's not a problem with God's word. There's not a problem with God's plan. Amen. I learned that. There's a problem with our heart. Amen. A problem with our willingness to submit. In order for the cleansing and the change to take place, it will have to be done God's way. And that brings me to my last point. Amen? Ver point number four. When he submitted, God did the work. I want to leave you with some hope this morning. When we submit, God will do the work. Do it exceedingly abundantly greater than we ever thought or imagined. It says in 2 Kings 5.14, Then he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. And the Bible says when he got up, guess what? He had the flesh of a little child and he was oh so clean. Hallelujah. Can you imagine that? I mean, I don't mean to be weird. I know I am kind of weird sometimes. But you know, I mean, I love babies. I work in, like, that's one of the reasons it's been hard for me to give up. My, I don't know when I say hard. I don't want to give up my job. I know, I know y'all know that. But, I mean, one of the reasons, because I love little babies. I love skin on them little babies. I like to look at them. I like to touch them. I like a baby's bum. It's so soft and, and white. You know, and well, sometimes they're not white, but you get the point. So it's, just, it's just so soft and, and it's so squishy and so lovable. Yeah. Amen. All of them cheeks. Oh, man, I love it. But, like, sometimes I, I get freaked out. Like, I mean, you know, like, I want to hold them. I grab them all the time. I know that sometimes they look at me, and they, they usually the parents smile. Sometimes I want to kiss them. I don't do that. I don't, I don't want to freak them out too bad. You know what I'm saying? Could you imagine how much, how good Naaman felt when he got up and he had, like, the skin of a baby's bum? <laughs> you know, whereas before he was all disfigured and jacked up and covering up his skin and walking through the streets and saying, unclean, unclean. And now he's got this fresh. Yeah. New, soft skin. New life. Oh, Hallelujah. Yeah. New life. Yes. That's what the gospel preaches. That's what the gospel yeah. promises. Hallelujah. A change. A new creature in Christ. It was like he was born all over again. Yeah. He had been healed of his disease. Hallelujah. His skin was all new. Yeah. I wanted to close with this last scripture. Romans 8, 2. Because previously I talked about the power of sin having control in a person's life. I got good news for you. When we submit to doing it God's way, it may not happen as quickly as you want it to. But I'm telling you right now, God is not a man that he should lie. His word does not lie. His word tells the truth. And I'm here to tell you that there is power in the gospel of Jesus yes, Christ. Lord. The word of God says in Romans 8 two that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. I need to tell you something this morning. I'm closing with a deep thought, but it ain't that deep. You can, you can grasp it. That there are, there's a spiritual, two spiritual laws that exist on the earth today. God put him in place. No, the enemy, because of, his, because of what he did in his disobedience and mankind's failure with the enemy, has allowed this law called sin and death to take place. God ordained it so because God wanted you to have a free will and to be willing to accept him. So God allowed the whole thing to, to take place. But it's called sin and death. It describes the sinful nature. It describes the part of man that's born like Adam the first time. It describes the part of man that is, that is bound by sin. It describes that part, that law that tells a person whether they're a Christian or not. Oh no, you're going to do what I tell you to do even though they know that they ain't supposed to do it. How many times have you been in that situation? Yeah. How many times have you faced that circumstance where the enemy will, has control of your life and he's telling you to go in a certain direction and to do certain things and you don't seem to have the, the power that you yeah. need in order to get free? I'm here to tell you that there is a law that is more powerful than that law. Amen. That law that is more powerful is the law of the spirit of life in 
Christ yes. Jesus. You remember that that illustration that Angie did last week? That was yes. so good. Wasn't it good? Yeah. Whenever, you know, she had me, I was supposed to be the believer, right? And, and, and I was circled. And all the people that encircled me represented being in Christ, represented Christ. And I was clothed with him. And all these other people that were surrounding, they were kind of like going around almost like, in, like Indians, like in those old movies, around the stagecoach, right? Because those were the trials of life. That was the power. You could also look at that as like it's the power of sin that's ruling and reigning in people's lives. And sometimes whenever those things are stronger that, that are because we don't understand or we haven't submitted to the will of God, they become bigger and bigger in our lives. And we're not focused on what it means to be in Christ. But I'm here to tell you what the word of God teaches is this, is that Jesus is real big and he's real tall right. and he's more powerful. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is more powerful than the law of sin and death. And if we will believe and we will continue to trust in what Christ has done, hallelujah, he has already done the work that releases the Holy Spirit. Let me just let me just repeat that one more time. Do you find some things in your life that you can't get done? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now my next question is this. Is there anything that the Holy Spirit can't get done? No. Absolutely not. What I'm trying to say is this. Proper faith submitted to what Jesus has already done at the cross, which allows you to be righteous in the eyes of God, releases the Holy Spirit to go to work Amen. in your life. Yes. It's a real simple message. It's... Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen.